Chapter 7, The Risk Takers The Risk Takers The days of defending your present possessions and positions are gone forever. Therefore, from this day forward, you will never have to concern yourself with such problematic issues as maintaining your present job or keeping up your current standard of living. Instead, you will put the things which can go wrong on the defensive, and you will put the things which must go right in ready formation for attack. As of today, you are a dynamic, vigorous risk-taker whose eyes are always turned toward your strengths and assets rather than toward your weaknesses and liabilities. Henceforth, you will wake up in the morning thinking only of the ways to do the things you want to do rather than waking up thinking of all the reasons why you cannot do those things. As of today, you will think repeatedly of the many achievements which you are going to accomplish in the future that are vastly superior to anything you have ever done in the past. For clearly, these are the results that can only be obtained if you are first willing to take some kind of a risk. Believe me, Once you undertake this process, it won't be long before you start winning, and in a big way. You should understand, however, that as you become increasingly involved in the risk-taking process, you will find yourself forced to draw upon resources which you previously didn't even realize you possessed. At first, this may prove to be very frightening to you. Nevertheless, you must always remember you will never hear of, read about, or see anyone who achieves anything of greatness in his or her own life without first taking some kind of a risk. As a case in point, just consider the monumental risks which all of our great religious leaders have undertaken during the course of their heroic lives. Then stop and reflect upon the enormous risks which all of our great business leaders have also undertaken during the span of their illustrious careers. Finally, as you seriously meditate upon these stupendous accomplishments, you will become increasingly aware of the fact that you too must become a risk-taker for you to develop the greatness you were born with. Moreover, you should understand that in truth, no genuine satisfaction in life can ever be attained by you or anyone else who simply refuses to take risks. For the life of anyone who chooses to live with extreme caution will never amount to anything more than a succession of dull, sporific days continuing on without interruption. The Diving Board Analogy To help you grasp the full implication of what I am saying, consider the following analogy. Just cast your mind back to the time when you were a child and attempt to recall the degree to which you admired the neighborhood kid who went right up the ladder and dived off the high diving board without any hesitation whatsoever. Then see if you can recall the feelings which you harbored in yourself as you watched him take that first risky leap into the water below. If you are like most of us, you probably lost just a little bit of your own self-respect at that time, until finally, out of sheer embarrassment, you too mustered up enough courage to jump. Finally, see if you can recollect how good you felt once you actually made the plunge and proved to the world that you could do it too. Now that you have taken your mind on this mental journey through your past, bring it forward to the present time. Let it become fully aware of the legions of men and women today who, like the young child looking longingly at the high diving board, would dearly love to quit their jobs, set out on an independent path, and do their own thing. However, due to their overwhelming fear of failure, these unfortunate people never quite work up enough courage to step out and actually take the plunge. As a result, such individuals miss out on many of the opportunities that life affords us. And what is even sadder, they never get a chance to plumb the depths of their own innate resources. Since they are afraid they might not make it, afraid they might lose, afraid they might fail, They simply choose to maintain the status quo and do nothing. The irony is, however, that even if a person should assiduously attempt to avoid all risks, he or she will still inevitably end up failing from time to time. But the point is, so what? What difference does it really make? After all, failing does not make us a failure, and the only time we do become a failure is when we decide to stop trying anymore. 
Therefore, even if we should falter along the way, we never really fail because we always retain the capacity to try once more. Flip Wilson's story. Flip Wilson, the famous comedian, is best known for his ability to make people laugh. But here is what he said in a somewhat more serious vein about his own experience with the risk-taking process. I fell down and I got up. I fell down and I got up. For 16 years, I did practically nothing else but fall down and get up. Even so, do you think Flip Wilson ever thought of himself as a failure? You bet your life he didn't, for if he had, he would have never found the courage to try just one more time, and you and I probably would never even have heard his name. You should understand at this juncture that as soon as you seriously set a big goal for yourself, you are going to become involved in a process of risk-taking, which will add a dimension of excitement, indeed a whole new flavor, to the course of your life. But at the same time, you should be aware that as you start engaging in more risk-taking behavior, the majority of people will be trying to avoid it at all costs. In other words, instead of taking meaningful risks, most people will continue to ensure themselves in a series of empty compromises. These compromises, in turn, will ultimately have the effect of reducing their existence to the level of a meaningless charade. To understand how this phenomena operates, just consider the people whom you know who have compromised when buying their new home. Why did they compromise, you ask? Because they were afraid that they wouldn't be able to make the mortgage payments on that dream home they truly wanted to live in. Then turn your mind to the veritable armies of individuals who remain in positions at work which they find dull and unrewarding. Why do they stay? Simply because they fear they would not be able to cope with the position which they would truly love to tackle. The, the irony is, of course, if these people would simply put themselves out on a limb by going after that better job or that dream home or whatever else it is they truly desire, they would then demand a commensurately better performance from themselves. As a result, they would soon discover that the risk they had taken was actually paying big dividends in all aspects of their life. The Young Millionaires Several years ago, I read an excellent book on the subject of risk-taking. It was entitled, The Young Millionaires, and it contained the true life stories of 18 individuals, each of whom had earned in excess of $1 million. In fact, some of these people had actually earned many millions of dollars over and above the $1 million mark during the course of their highly successful careers. Throughout the book, the author made many interesting observations about the law of financial success, but the most important one was the one which he kept coming back to. Namely, although these individuals came from a variety of different backgrounds, and although each had earned their money in a different way, they all shared one thing in common. What was that one thing, you ask? Simply put, it was this. Even though everything they owned was riding on the outcome of virtually every major business decision which they made, none of them considered themselves to be taking risks. The reason they didn't, he went on to explain, was because they were living their lives as though it were impossible to fail. Note, however, that in the eyes of most people, there would be no question that these individuals were actually taking tremendous risks, and on an almost daily basis. Fighter Pilot Study In a similar vein, research done many years ago, which investigated the lives of fighter pilots in World War II, determined conclusively that, contrary to what you might think, many of the pilots who played it safe during the war were among the first to be killed in combat. By way of contrast, the study also found that, practically without exception, not only were the surviving aces individuals who refused to play it safe, but they were the greatest risk-takers throughout the war. Indeed, as one has the opportunity to observe the performance of individuals from all walks of life, it soon becomes evident that whoever plays it safe in life dies, and dies relatively young. 
For although many of these individuals remain clinically alive for numerous years, when their hearts finally cease beating, it is a mere formality, because the truth is, they have never really lived. By now, you have probably said to yourself, all of this sounds eminently reasonable, but why should it be? Or, why are so many of us destined to go through our entire lives in this condition of self-imposed misery? simply because we are unable or unwilling to take meaningful risks. Well, it seems to me, if we will only cast our minds back to the formative years of our own lives, we will soon recognize where this reluctance to engage in risk-taking behavior has its source. Once we have arrived at that point, I believe we will have come a long way in our attempt to combat and ultimately neutralize this insidious problem. I exhort you, therefore, to pay very strict attention to the information which will now be set out before you. When you were a young child, in fact, even as far back as the time when you were an infant, your parents desperately wanted to see you succeed. As a consequence of this wish, they were terrified by the prospect you might somehow fall short of their expectations of you. This was perfectly natural, in light of the fact they loved you very dearly. Unfortunately, however, it motivated them to attempt to shelter you from every potential harm which might come up in your life. For example, when you first started to walk, they were right by your side, and as soon as you even looked like you were going to stumble, they quickly grabbed onto you so you would not fall and hurt yourself. Similarly, when you engaged in your first fist fight with the little terror next door, your parents were there to soothe the bruised feelings. They probably tried to console you by saying, you were right, dear, and the other wrong. The other child was a bully. Next, they probably said something like, in the future, dear, be very careful, and try to stay away from the kids like that. Moreover, if your upbringing was typical of that of most of us, your first bicycle probably brought with it repeated warnings such as, be careful, don't fall, watch out, and so on. In this manner, you were slowly but surely programmed to make every move in your life with a brilliant caution light burning brightly on the screen of your impressionable young mind. You must gain the awareness, therefore, that regardless of what anyone may have told you to the contrary, none of us was ever born with a fear of taking risks. For as I have clearly indicated above, the fear of taking risks is something which we learned only after we entered this wonderful world of ours. In fact, contrary to what many people will have mistakenly been led to believe, the human being, if left to his or her own devices, is a born risk-taker who is naturally programmed to follow the path which will eventually lead to greatness in his or her own life. But be that as it may, before you embark on this exciting path of risk-taking, you should remember to never lose sight of the fact that becoming a risk-taker does not mean becoming an irresponsible individual. If you really think it through, you will realize these two concepts are mutually exclusive. For becoming a risk-taker means to act courageously, and to act courageously is considerably different from acting foolishly, which is how a person acts when he or she behaves in an irresponsible manner you might encounter a few situations where the line separating these two concepts becomes extremely narrow. Nevertheless, it is absolutely essential you never cross over that line, inadvertently or otherwise. Another thing which you must be aware of is that risk-taking is always a relative term. In other words, behavior which represents a risk to one person may not necessarily represent a risk to another person. Moreover, if the same behavior were carried out by a third party, one might even be tempted to deem it irresponsible conduct. It is clear, therefore, that one must be able to distinguish among these different concepts with a significant degree of accuracy. In order to achieve this, it becomes necessary to go back to one of the basic principles involved in the process of self-development. You must be able to see with your inner eye yourself already in possession of the good you desire. Risk-taking versus irresponsibility. People who are irresponsible 
very rarely accomplish anything of importance, and quite often they invite real harm to themselves. They might occasionally become involved in some activities which are successful, but these results occur so infrequently and they are so overshadowed by negative results that they are hardly even worth mentioning. Consider, for example, the individual who dives off a high cliff and into a shallow body of water simply because he has been dared to do so by a group of his peers. Although the person in question is afraid to dive for some strange reason, he is even more afraid of what the others might say to him or even think about him if he chose not to dive. Clearly, the person's fear of diving is perfectly reasonable in view of the fact he has had absolutely no training as a diver. Furthermore, as a result of his lack of training, when he does contemplate what might happen if he did dive, he visualizes himself being very seriously injured. Obviously, for an individual such as this to go ahead and dive would be extremely foolish, to say the least. And the person's actions would have to be considered irresponsible by anyone's standards. On the other hand, however, if this same person trained to become a professional diver, and if he were skilled at taking all of the various factors into consideration, for example, if he were able to visualize himself successfully going through all of the necessary motions, such as swimming to shore, stepping back on land unharmed, etc., then it would be a totally different situation. For although the person would still be taking a definite risk, no one could accuse him of acting in an irresponsible manner. Consider for a moment the stunt people who work in the movie industry. These individuals are constantly performing dangerous acts. In fact, that is precisely what they get paid for. But do not be deceived, for the men and women who perform these stunts are not amateurs by any means. They are all competent professionals, highly skilled in the performance of their dangerous trade. They always check and then double-check every calculation before they make even the simplest move. As a result of these precautions, they are very rarely ever injured. No, there cannot be any question about it. Stunt people are risk-takers, to be sure, but they are very rarely irresponsible individuals. Investments Now turn your attention to the person who invests his or her hard-earned savings in a venture about which he or she knows practically nothing. Perhaps someone, possibly a relative, whom the person may have held in high esteem, suggested this investment was a great idea and the investors stood to earn an extraordinarily high rate of return on it. Assume, moreover, that despite the person's very grave misgivings about going into the venture at all, he is also being strongly motivated by greed to seek the highest possible rate of return which can be earned on the money invested. Finally, suppose that the tremendous fear of loss notwithstanding, the person decides to go ahead and make the investment anyway. What happens next? After the investment has been made, most of the person's waking hours will probably be spent, one, worrying about the investment, and two, visualizing himself reduced to a state of abject poverty. It is abundantly clear, therefore, that this sort of behavior must be deemed the polar opposite of financial responsibility, and the person involved must be considered imprudent and irresponsible rather than a bona fide risk-taker. The unusual outcome in a situation such as this is predictable, if not pleasing. The individual in question loses the money, not to mention the former friendship of the individual who originally suggested the investment. The reason is that foolish, irresponsible people seldom blame themselves for making such an error. On the other hand, however, if that person listened carefully to the suggestion of his friend or relative and then studied the situation for himself, he could have formed an opinion which was based on sound knowledge rather than hearsay and which was motivated by genuine interest rather than simple greed. At that point, the individual could have gone ahead and invested a sum of money which would not have placed his total financial situation in jeopardy. Then, as he gathered more information based on actual experience, 
he could have gradually increased his investment if such action appeared to be in his best interest. Clearly, if our hypothetical individual followed this second course of action, he would still certainly be taking a risk. However, one could not justifiably say he was behaving in the manner of a fool or an irresponsible person. Moreover, even in the eventuality that this person made a bad judgment call and lost his money, that would have been all he had lost, for he would still have his friendship, and he would still have his own self-respect, because he would realize he had been guilty of nothing more than an error in judgment. An added benefit of this second approach is that the individual would not automatically reject future investment possibilities should they arise. I am sure you are getting my message loud and clear. Risk-takers are knowledgeable people who study situations carefully, have confidence in their own abilities, and have a very healthy self-image. Put more succinctly, we can say risk-takers, unlike irresponsible people, are nobody's fool. Business Failures Consider this. If one were to examine the statistics regarding the number of business failures each year, Without closely studying each situation separately, one could very easily conclude that going into business for oneself is an irresponsible act. However, that is just not the case. The truth of the matter is, many of the people who have gone into bankruptcy should never have gone into business for themselves in the first place, either because they weren't properly prepared for such an undertaking or because they simply didn't know what they were doing. They lacked the skill, the knowledge, or the proper support to get their businesses off the ground. Bear in mind that although it takes most new companies at least three years before they are properly established, some of these individuals didn't allow for three months or even three weeks to give their businesses a chance. It is also significant to note that prior to setting out on their own, many of these people were those employees who thought their boss was incompetent or the owners of the company which employed them didn't know what they were doing. Obviously, everyone who fails to get a new business going does not fall into this category, but there are certainly many people who do. Nevertheless, despite the woeful statistics, there are certainly many individual risk-takers who have succeeded in establishing businesses of their own. For example, just consider the story of my good friend Bob McCrary. Bob had worked in the electronics industry for many years. And although he had never earned what one might consider big money, he certainly earned a better than average income. He owned his own home, he raised three beautiful daughters, and accomplished all this while working for someone else. But despite his undisputed success, Bob harbored a desire to go into business for himself, and I suppose fear was the only thing holding him back from doing so. The truth of the matter was that with all the things he had going for him, Bob couldn't have helped but succeed. Unfortunately, however, he was unaware of this because he had never been out on his own before. More, moreover, he had been raised to believe the old idea that a person should get a steady job and then work for a pension. Still, the desire of Bob and his wife Pat to work in their own business persisted. It eventually grew to the point where they were actually able to visualize their business operating successfully. Since it is impossible to hold an image in the mind without also expressing it, the end result of Bob and Pat's imaging was the birth of their own company, Pensacola Electronics. That happy event occurred just a few short years ago, and although both Bob and Pat have worked many hard hours and still do today, they have the satisfaction of looking at what they have created together. They gainfully employ numerous people, and they properly service hundreds of clients located in various American states. They have both earned a sizable income, and the net value of their company today, if they were to sell it, is greater than all of the money Bob had earned working for the other company for all of those years. Did Bob and Pat make the right decision? Just ask them. Would they make it again? You know what their answer would be. Are they risk takers? I don't think there is any question about that. Bob and Pat McCrary left their jobs and invested many thousands of dollars to do something which they had never done before. They had no written guarantee they would succeed in their new venture, 
but they were not irresponsible, nor were they acting imprudently. Were they afraid? Well, I have never asked them directly, but after studying human nature for the greater part of twenty years, I feel quite confident in asserting they were. The salient point for our purposes, however, is despite their trepidation, they had the courage to act in the face of their fear. For the person who analyzes a situation carefully prepares himself accordingly and then proceeds in the face of fear with the image of success in mind is a genuine risk-taker. Furthermore, as you are already aware, risk-takers very rarely lose, and even when they do, they usually bounce right back to try again. In other words, risk-takers live exciting, creative lives because they are living the kind of life that we are all intended to live. So put a smile on your face, because as of this moment, you too can become a bona fide risk taker. How? Simply by doing the thing you have dreamed about, off and on for months, or possibly even years. In the great musical, South Pacific, Mary Martin sang, If you don't have a dream, if I don't have a dream, how are we going to make a dream come true? It is my belief that every one of us has our own dream. We all have a vision, an idea, or a picture of some great or grand thing or accomplishment which will float to the surface of our consciousness from time to time. Moreover, for a few brief moments, we permit ourselves the luxury of enjoying ourselves doing, being, or having whatever that dream might be. There is no doubt in my mind that you, too, hold a picture of something which floats to the surface of your consciousness periodically, and if the truth were to be known, you would dearly love to execute that dream. Well, the simple truth is, you can, but in all likelihood, it is going to require a considerable amount of courage on your part. Remember, it makes no difference at this moment how bizarre your idea may appear. In fact, you might even regard it yourself as being sheer fantasy. Nevertheless, you can begin to turn it into a reality by making a written description of whatever it is you would like to do, have, or be. Write out your ambition in as much detail as possible and in the present tense. Do not write it out as something that you are planning to do. Rather, write it out as if it were something you are doing currently, in big bold letters write, I can, and then yell it, say it, sing it, drill the idea that you are now going to do this thing into your subconscious mind. Then choose a friend who has a lot of confidence in you, someone whose thinking is compatible with your own, not someone who will put you down and laugh at your idea, to share your idea with. Select someone who will build you up and help instill confidence in you with respect to your idea. Remember, it makes no difference whether your goal is starting a new business, buying or building a new home, getting a new automobile, a new position at work, setting a sales record, or getting an honors mark in school. Whatever it may be, you must step out and boldly pursue it. Keep reminding yourself that you have tremendous reservoirs of potential within you, and therefore you are quite capable of doing almost anything you set your mind to. All you must do is figure out how you can do it, not whether or not you can. Begin to visualize yourself as a risk-taker, and then start telling yourself you are one. Become fully aware of the good vibrations you get, simply by virtue of practicing these simple mental exercises. But before you proceed any further with your quest, find yourself a pad and pen. Then prepare a balance sheet by taking an eight and a half by eleven sheet of paper and drawing a straight line down the center of the page. On the left hand side, place a minus sign, and on the right hand side, place a plus sign. Under the minus sign, write out the very worst thing that could happen to you if you were to follow through with your idea. On the right-hand side, write out all the good things, the very best things that could happen to you if you were to go ahead with your plan. Clearly understand that so long as what you plan to do is honest and honorable, whatever goes on the left-hand side of the page is not going to be disastrous. 
On the other hand, however, what goes on the right-hand side of the page could turn out to be absolutely magnificent. Therefore, by creating the balance sheet in this manner, you are demonstrating to yourself, for your own edification, the fact you actually have nothing to lose. It has already been brought to your attention numerous times in this book that simply missing the mark does not make you a failure. It only means that your plan did not work out as you had anticipated. So even if you should lose everything you own, you still retain the capacity to bounce back to try once again. For several years now, I have been in the habit of reading the biographies and autobiographies of men and women who have truly accomplished something of significance in their lifetime. I have found, moreover, that almost without exception, these individuals had fallen short of their goals on numerous occasions, but that never deterred them. Indeed, I myself have experienced failure to hit the mark on a number of occasions, and I will readily admit it hurts a little, and it even causes a certain amount of embarrassment. But, but be that as it may, it has never stopped me from trying again, and it need not stop you either because we all possess the ability to get up and get going once again. Therefore, this very moment, make up your mind that you are going to become the risk taker you truly wish to become.